I need to take that computer, burn it, and get a new one. Uh, I've had that one a while, and I need to just buy a new one. So, uh, let's talk about mental health and COVID, right? And it's something I've seen a lot of articles on. I've seen a lot that are very well-intentioned, but maybe not the best written or the most helpful. Things like, oh, think of something better, bigger than yourself. Well, that's wonderful, but when someone has some pre-existing trauma, then there's often kind of a feeling of being small and undesirable or your needs not mattering anyway. So I think that can be a very well-intentioned but not great uh, starting place if you have any kind of self-esteem issues or predilections toward depression, right? So uh, if you feel like a lot of the stuff that you are reading or hearing about is, is kind of uh, dull or unhelpful, you're not alone. So I specialize in a therapy called EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. So I was going on about that a little bit before. I'll just recap it. It was discovered in the late 80s by Francine Shapiro. She looked around in a forest when she was, or a park when she was walking around. She noticed that she felt better after her eyes moved around and she was thinking about something negative. So she systematized it. She was in grad school for psychology. She turned it into EMDR. It started out as EMD, eye movement desensitization, where it would just involve her going through a protocol where someone would think of whatever was bothering them, whatever traumatic event, right? And then desensitizing it while moving their eyes, right? So what that means is they would think about the event, they, they just that target is what we would call that. So let's say you had a horrible car crash, okay? And Shapiro would direct people to move their eyes while thinking of it and it would desensitize, I mean, it would take the emotional vividness out of that event. Now, later she added on the R, the reprocessing, okay? And so what that is, is thinking of the event while once you've gotten the negative charge, we call it, out of, the, of that event, thinking about the um, a desired positive thought, like I survived this or I'm strong, right? So you can see, and you layer it on top. So you can see how the... Um, the therapy of EMDR can be extremely useful for anything traumatic. So for now, things like COVID, there's a whole issue that just came out. My article was in it for a little plug there, but a lot of other articles had to do with COVID. The latest issue of the EMDR Journal of Practice and Research, okay? So COVID is an ongoing trauma. It's, a, it's, it's one that's chronic. And so you have this element of kind of a grinding unfathomable, ineffable, un intangible thing that you can't quite put your fingers on, right? You're safe, uh, hopefully. Um, but what I mean is you're not under direct threat of being attacked physically or at, at risk of death in the immediate present. But what is happening is a sense of sort of ongoing danger, right? In the background of your mind. And so there are many articles now that are getting at the point that, well, this qualifies as trauma, right? Because you're afraid for your life to some degree. There is a stressor, there's a threat there, and people aren't more on edge, right? And so the symptoms of more negative cognitions, more emotional instability and lack of sleep, and more like intrusive negative thoughts and desire to avoid, all of those things are incorporated in the definition of trauma. So I think what we have to do is look at this and say, not, not look at this and be immobilized and say, well, it's time to give up. Or look at it and say, well, I'm not trying hard enough and I need, to, I need to think about people who have it worse than me. If that helps, it helps. But it doesn't always. So what can really help, though, is to take it, look at it, be of this mindset of what we would call radical acceptance. Adopt a radical acceptance framework, which means saying this is happening and I can't change external circumstances right now, but what I can do is change my relationship to them. I can, I can take control over my immediate surroundings. I can go do something around my home, do some home improvements that I want. I can work on gardening. I can work any multitude of things that you would want to, to do that maybe you've put off or maybe um, are at kind of the background. It's like, well, now might be a really good time to do that, right? So that's one way. That's one way that's like a non-cringe, non-live, laugh, love, actual therapeutic suggestion, okay? So 
Another thing would be, I mean, so I just went over what EMDR is like, well, why did I do that? And I'm skipping around. Well, I'll just say it's really good to, to, to go and find someone who does EMDR therapy. You can find it through going to EMDRIA, EMDRIA, we usually pronounce it as a word, dot org. Okay, emdria.org. You can put in your zip code on the little find a provider near me tab. So that's awesome. That's, that's something I highly recommend. Um, and so what is EMDR? Well, it is a therapy that involves a, a really multi-phase approach. So it goes from preparation, treatment planning. Uh, it very The very first thing that you typically do is answer a therapist's questions about, do you have dissociative tendencies? Do you tend to, uh, me, meaning do you, when, when traumatic memories come up, feel like you are, are phasing out and not in the room and somewhere else, right? Um, that's not helpful, but it, it, there are many people who are afflicted by that. And actually COVID is creating that kind of malaise where people will just kind of freeze and not know what they're doing, not know what's going on. If you're experiencing that, that's a very mild form of dissociation, by the way. So don't feel like you're crazy or that something is wrong or that you are broken in some way. You're experiencing a very physiologically, like a very ancient and, and, and mentally salient response that protects people. It protects them from... from Having a, a huge breakdown in the moment can help people sometimes to even function in the midst of, of huge traumas. But on an ongoing level, it's not helpful, right? That's what makes the difference is if someone is continually dissociating and not present, they're not able to engage in their life. They're not able to know what's going on to form meaningful memories, to do any of that. So you can see how it's a big problem. And COVID is causing that to be a huge issue. So EMDR is very well researched for that because what it does, if you think about it, there's an optimal level of stress that we all have in what's called the, Dan Siegel talked about this. It's called the, the window of tolerance, okay? Dr. Dan Siegel, um, very famous expert on trauma. And it's, it's when we get too upset about something, we get hyper aroused, right? And that means that you're way too upset and likely to have a panic attack. And then if you drop down from that into freezing, right, instead of fight or flight would be hyperarousal. Freezing is what we would call hypoarousal. Dissociating is hypoarousal. It's kind of is tuning out, zoning out of the situation and going somewhere else mentally. And that's not helpful because if every time you do that, when trauma comes up, you're not going to be able to function. And so what we want to do is those two edges of that window, when you leave it, everything in that, we, we want to be in the middle. We want to be within what's called that window of tolerance. So just enough arousal, but not too much, right? So what that arousal meaning an emotional charge. So we want to be able to function. Some stress is actually healthy. Um, I know that's a mind-blowing thing to think about, but stress, chronic Stress where you feel like you can't do anything about your situation, learned helplessness in other words, that's unhelpful. That's that increased heart rate um, to a point of not feeling like you can do anything, to a point of feeling immobilized almost. You freak out and then immobilize, right? That's that kind of batting back and forth between hyperarousal and hypoarousal. Not helpful, right? If you've experienced that, you're not alone. It's, it's very common. Like going from just freaking out to collapsing. It's like we want to avoid that, right? We want to leap into action and be able to do something, but not feel overwhelmed. And so EMDR helps with that because the eye movement back and forth distracts from the memory enough, puts enough distance between you and that, tasks you on a, on a presently focused um, activity, task, right, of eye movement, that your brain is able to think about the trauma without decompensating or dissociating and it is charged enough that you're able to do something with it go through the memory recognize you're here in the present there are many different theoretical models for how emdr works i'm not afraid to say that so one is that uh, according to the free energy principle the brain this is very new stuff by the way the brain wants to reduce surprise it wants to reduce uncertainty right and reduce free energy that's being dedicated to Things like what ifs, right? You want to know. You want to you want to reduce suspense, right? We all do. So 
eye movement is a perfect test of doing that. Carl Friston, the founder of the free energy, the discoverer, I should say, he didn't invent it, he observed it, right? If it's a principle in the brain, it's observed, not invented. But he observed the free energy principle and said that, that horizontal eye movements are the perfect experiment because there's, um, it, you're gathering data, right? And so when you're thinking of a traumatic memory, now don't do this on your own. It's very important to find someone who's trained in EMDR, right? It's like, well, if I, all I have to do is move my eyes, I can do this at home. No, because you may have a flashback. You may relive this stuff, right? And the goal is not to do that. It's to go through and overcome it with a therapist there. It would be like going whitewater rafting alone. Yeah, you could try it, but what happens if you fall out and you get ripped? taken under a, a current, right? It's like, ah, that's not so great. You need a buddy. You need a trained person to guide you through it, through EMDR, especially if it gets stuck, right? So, but back to what I was saying, eye movements go back and forth. You're thinking about what it is that's negative, right? And so that element is active. You're thinking about the memory, the elements of it too, of like I was um, I was mugged, I was assaulted, whatever, I was in a car wreck. Okay, I'm moving my eyes. The therapist is telling me, okay, stop that. <sighs> Take a breath. What did you notice? So, you're collecting data with your eye movements in the present and teaching your brain, essentially, you're retraining it. Wait a minute, I'm looking around, I'm safe, okay? I'm well, I'm okay. And that happened. That memory, that thing is real, but it's over now. And so what you can do, what I would encourage, is finding an EMDR therapist, telling them what it is that's bothering you when you're burned out or stressed, okay? Because we're talking about burnout too. Burnout is a form of trauma, really, okay? Everything with trauma doesn't have to be that you were assaulted or feared for your life. That's PTSD, potentially. That's the traumatic diagnosis of that. But there are other, what, we, what Francine Shapiro, the founder of EMDR, called little t traumas. And those involve things like feeling like you're not good enough to speak up. Feeling like, like in your family, always being told that your ideas were stupid. Like, did you ever fear for your life from that? Maybe not. But did you feel completely unimportant? Mm, yes. So that's developmentally relevant as a trauma because you felt that your needs didn't matter. So any time that you've been accustomed to feeling like you're a child and don't matter, and as you're an adult, right? We're talking about, I mean, children matter anyway, but we're talking about like when you're an adult and you go into that like helpless child state, that means some trauma happened. If you go into something where you feel like you have to do everything for people like you did for your dad or your mom, that's result of trauma, right? So EMDR helps with that because you go back to whatever the seed memory, that foundational, what we call touchstone memory is that caused that reenact those trauma, um, those, those traumatic protocols of behavior, you know, and we go and we extinguish that, meaning we take the emotional vividness out of it. So it's like you notice, okay, my heart rate's increasing, I'm upset, I feel like I have to, to help my partner like I did my dad when he was drunk or whatever. It's like, okay, notice that, back and forth, Whew, you're okay. And of course, this isn't just one thing, typically. It's not just one session that you have of EMDR. It's an entire therapy. So to walk through it a little bit, your therapist will treatment plan with you, ask you your targets, they will go through and um, uh, help to determine like what what is it that we want to work on here? Are you ready for it? Meaning, is it something that you can um, overcome with your, is, or do you have the tools for that? Do you have the ability to do that stuff are you are you going to dissociate do we need to take a little more time to actually um prepare and do some breath work right and it may that may be the case right but even so you're on the right path you're on the path to using emdr to heal your your wounds and the therapist will let you know like hey i think you're ready or hey i don't think you're ready yet and you might not be for a while so they'll be honest with you on that. I mean, if you're watching this group and you're functioning in a profession, I think you will probably be somewhat ready for EMDR. I would venture to say that. I mean, you're probably in a place where you're at least able to hold down a job and really a very stressful job. So clearly you have a capacity for uh, maintaining some degree of emotional 
stability, okay? That's the good news. So you probably will be able to, after doing some brief EMDR preparation exercises, like imagining a calm place, imagining that you can put your trauma away in a box and leave it there until the next session, you'll probably be very able to um, emotionally handle that kind of stuff and go into like doing your worst trauma, right? So usually we start with the worst or the first as a target for EMDR, okay? And the worst is usually like what it sounds like. It's the thing that made the most impact on you. So it might not be something that happened in childhood. You might have had something that happened in childhood, like you were never picked first or you felt terrible in your family, but you might have like survived an earthquake and seen terrible things. You might have seen awful stuff and that's now what is most relevant. Often it's the first stuff that is the worst, not always though. So just keep that in mind. Your therapist will ask that. They'll be like, well, what do you think? What are you here for? What is the target that's most salient for you? What do you think we, we should work on? And they'll, of course, guide. They'll be like, ah, I don't know if we're ready. But typically, the EMDR protocol, we call it the three-prong protocol, goes with most the, the first of the worst trauma, a present version of that, like what brings that up now, and then a future version where you imagine that something is happening and you like it in the future you imagine like you're reminded of that traumatic event and how you wish to respond and you install it's called an alternative behavior now doesn't that sound cool so you're like virtually instilling this resilience and teaching yourself wait a minute this this isn't something that i have to deal with anymore i'm over this it's like how does that relate to covid well so it is what you want to do when you get upset about COVID stuff and meaning, you know, that you're home, whatever you imagine walking around outside, you imagine moving your body. If you feel restricted, you imagine talking to someone and maybe having a socially distant get together. I mean, I know everyone's tired of that stuff. I got to be honest with you. I'm not here to tell you what to do to feel better in our world right now like on a moral level. I'm not here to push down your throat what to do on that stuff. What I am here to do is to validate that, of course, this stuff sucks, and we've got to get through this in a way that doesn't jeopardize our own health and that does give us some degree of acknowledgement that, hey, maybe this isn't exactly what I want. What can I do? Can I meet with my friend in person but six feet apart with a mask? Like, okay, maybe that's more for you. Right, maybe that's more your speed than doing Zoom anymore. Right, I <laughs> I know about that. My fricked off, and now I'm using my phone here. It's like okay, compromising. It's more important for me to talk to you all about trauma is to get all pissy about the computer. Right, so okay, so it's more. It should be more important to you to get your self care in than it is how that comes. Like, and and if it if you don't like what's actually available, like what you're thinking of and what you're having told to you. Like, well, what can I do that still respects the rules that we're under now that helps that helps you out, right? So that's kind of a big thing I would also push is I'm kind of bouncing around here. I'm talking about EMDR and how it can be helpful. And I'm talking about other stuff. Um, box breathing is really helpful. So breathing to the count of, inhaling to the count of four, holding that for four seconds, exhaling to the count of four, and then holding that exhale, so meaning that emptiness before breathing in again. That's something to do when you start to notice tension in your body because that will help you to decrease physical arousal, meaning tension, anxiety, stress, and increase calmness. So again, I mean, I'm not telling you that the answer to all this stuff is just to sit and take it. You have to get creative with it. That's why a lot of people are doing work around the home or doing things that are that are you know a little more creative. Going outdoors and meeting outside. So depending on what state you're in or even what the temperature is even that week, it's more or less helpful to do that or it's going to be more or less feasible for you. So I understand that as well. You know, if someone has a heat lamp and you can gather with some people and hang out, that might be a really good idea, right? Um, don't not sharing food after each other. I think a, a lot of this is going to be some common sense precautions on hygiene mixed with open air environments. So if you keep those things in mind, like washing your hands frequently, not touching your mouth after touching anything anyone else has, I mean, that's something that germ freaks like me have been doing for a while.
But then the added thing of not making sure nobody's reading on you, that's a little harder, can be done. And what so whatever you're playing with within those really good guidelines would seem to be pretty safe. But again, disclaimer, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you that all or nothing thinking therapeutic thing, by the way. All or nothing thinking is that thought of, well, I'm either going to go have a party, I'm going to go to a like a, an EDM festival or water world, you know, or I'm going to sit at home alone and talk to everybody on Zoom. It's like, wait a minute, there's a middle way, right? Middle way is a very, very big term. In Buddhism, it's a very big term. In dialectical behavior therapy, which is what I, one of the therapies that I do, where a dialectic is two opposing ideas that you synthesize to make one, right? So let me give an example, okay? Maybe I don't go to a huge, you know, warehouse party, underground rave, and get COVID, and maybe I don't sit at home and not do anything. Aha, right? There's a middle way between those two, okay? And that middle way would be getting together with a few people safely in an open-air environment, whether that's inside with some circulating air outside, whatever, right? It's like, start thinking that way. Start thinking about the least acceptable option, right? Meaning, I'm not phrasing that the best way. What I'm saying is the um, safest but least dangerous option that you're willing to accept. It's like, am I willing to accept just a few friends? Does it have to be everything I was hoping for? Okay, but, but it has to be more than, than me being at home, right? So, okay, that gives you a lot of room to actually work with, okay? So, enough about that, though. Um... I would say really start to notice when you when tension arises in your body because that's probably the onset of some anxiety and your thoughts will follow along with you. Anxiety can be triggered by things in our environment that on an unconscious level raise a certain response in us. So I'll give you an example. Smell is a very powerful sense. It's, I think, by far the most potent of the five. So if you smell something that reminds you of like a past abuser or something associated with a food that really made you sick or a situation where you're really uncomfortable, it'll probably arouse and elicit a certain reaction on your part. And then you start to notice your mood dampening, right? It's like no, you probably are going to notice a physical aversion, a physical anxiety before it hits your brain. Start to interact with that, you know, purposefully untense your body and relax it. Breathe deeply, like I said earlier, to the count of four, all the way around. Inhale, ex hold, exhale, hold, you know, inhale, hold, all of that stuff. So those are going to be some really powerful tools that you can use. It's really going to be important to play a detective on your own functioning. And what that means is not that you have to be hypervigilant and super obsessive about your own behavior, because God knows that level of perfectionism is not going to serve you well. But what I am saying is notice the typical clenching of your your hands or your chest that you may take for granted okay if you if you're tense after sitting in a screen I have a huge amount of empathy for teachers and let me tell you why because I was working a job at an agency where I was seeing like six seven people a day on zoom doing therapy with them and let me tell you there's stuff that's lost when it comes to on the screen stuff I mean there's a level of like getting up and moving around and greeting people and your eyes moving around. That's just not there on a screen, right? And and I acknowledge that because EMDR works that way too. I was thinking of how I was going to integrate this discussion today and how I would mention the fact that there's research that shows that if someone views a, a traumatic scene or something upsetting or traumatic, if they play the game Tetris within 24 hours, they encode that memory of the trauma as less aversive, it's less vivid. Well, why is that? Well, something called uh, overwriting of the visuospatial sketch pad in the brain. I don't expect you to remember all that, but it's very pertinent to know to, just the operating principle is when you do something that gets your mind off of and gets your eyes active off of trauma and you do that intentionally, you're, you're, you're teaching your brain that you are safe and it's, it's much more effective than staring stationary at a screen, right? So maybe you don't watch TV if you're feeling upset and you instead do something that requires you to look around and that activates your brain to scan around. Like I was saying earlier, eye movements, horizontal eye movements, like from EMDR, are crucial to your brain recognizing that you're safe. It's like, oh, okay, so I am now 
moving about, determining like that I'm, I'm my brain is, is determining I'm safe, right? And so that's very cool. Yeah, Mallory, it is crazy. So, and it's also really cool when you do it intentionally so that you train your brain that when that comes up, when a stressor comes up, that you are consciously safe and choosing to be safe and doing something else. So, um, I was just thinking I, I wouldn't want to, I wanted to tell everyone if you, if you feel like you're not get even though you're viewing your students or fellow, um, colleagues or your friends, whatever on zoom, and, and you feel like it's not quite the same, it very well may be that your eyes aren't having to move as much and you're not having to take in as much information. And so you don't feel as gratified. It's not as multi-sensory either. You just not the smells, the touches, whatever, right? I mean, that's obvious, but when it comes to screen education and things, it's less obvious because there is a lot you can do with screens. I'm not downplaying that. One of the biggest positive things right now about the EMDR can offer in the midst of COVID is that a therapist can actually provide EMDR to fidelity, meaning without sacrificing anything, over the screen. Now, not over the phone really because the screen is too small, unless the client is like zooming in and I wouldn't recommend that. Um, you know, for eye strain possibly. But on a computer screen, if someone can pass their eyes completely left and right, we call that a full pass, a full set. If they can do that while looking at their computer screen, they're golden. You're doing EMDR, right, with a client as a therapist. And so what I would do is I would have my computer open and I would kind of, you know, move it to the side and get out of the frame and be moving my hand back and forth, okay? Um, and that's how I was doing EMDR. And it's just not the same as being back in the office with my clients, right? Now, it was very similar, but there's something that's lost. And so what we have to do is radically accept that something has been lost. Don't gaslight yourself, okay? I've seen a lot of people doing that. I've heard of a lot of people kind of beating up on themselves. If, you're high, if you are a high achiever right now, you're probably going to be beating up on yourself for dissociating and, and daydreaming and feeling like you're checking out. And I don't know why, but I'm here to tell you. That is a trauma response, okay? So I found this really interesting article that says your surge capacity is depleted. And it's from Tara Hall, Halley, maybe H-A-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. I can compile this all in an email or a post to, to put in a group at some point. I can send it to Mallory. But um, so I learned what surge capacity was. So Ann Maston, a psychologist, it talks about surge capacity, which is a collection of adaptive systems, mental and physical, that humans draw on for short-term survival in acutely stressful situations, such as natural disasters. So I, being a trauma arousal, I would call that being hypervigilant. Okay, hypervigilance is what we typically call that. Surge capacity sounds more badass, though, so I'm going to go with that. That's fine. Um, yeah, I'll send the citations, Mallory. What I'll do is I'll, I'll just say, hey, here are the articles we can look at. But um, the, the idea of a surge capacity is basically that the reserves, your energy reserves. So this woman who was writing this article is very well accomplished. She's helped in humanitarian crises, things like that. And she just noticed that it was just dragging around, like, like many people are right now. And she's wondering why that is. And, and a big reason for that is the fact that, well... The, the same sort of environments and, and recharging elements are not there. And we're having to make them. And we're not really being told that. We're getting, I mean, we are and we aren't. We're being kind of told to just keep going as much as we can. Well, how? Well, thankfully, this article talks about it a lot, and I made some notes on it. I would say the first one, one of the big things to keep in mind is this is what we would call an ambiguous loss. So, and that's something that Pauline Boss, PhD, talks about in this little article that it, it's unclear and it lacks a resolution. Any loss that has those features. It's un, being unclear and lacking resolution. So I would say, and this is something too, by the way, that I was aware of as a trauma therapist, that if someone passes away that you knew very well and they, you know, they've had a lot of time to say goodbye, that's not great. It's still loss. But there's closure, right? Like you maybe had a chance to say goodbye. You know the person passed away and you know it was on maybe their terms even. And so... There's a, that's a loss, but it's an, okay? Yeah, surge capacity. So, um, but when you have an, an ambiguous loss, you could, you could call the last one a certain loss, right? Like you know something happened and you know you need to move on. 
But for missing persons, the, the author talks about, which is a really sad example, right? But you have to kind of move on and say, well, we may never find that person, or we may. Either way, I have to keep living. And so it's a very grim example, but I think it's very useful. And I think it's something where it's even less uncertain than that. It's more, I don't know if in 2021 we're going to be having foam parties or multi-stage electronic dance music festivals. I'm a big music festival fan if you haven't gotten that from my examples. I'm not just using them randomly. But uh, the industry, it's very interesting. That industry in particular is actually kind of adapting. And so we're seeing like drive-in shows, okay, which, you know, hopefully those are safe in terms of the driving afterward. But there's certain things that are like kind of a, a, a compromise, like a, a, like a no but. Like a no, we can't do this thing, but we can do this other thing that takes the elements you like from this one event, gives it to you in kind of an abbreviated form, maybe, maybe a little more hassle, but you have this alternative. And so I would say that's something to keep in mind that you have to give yourself permission to say, Okay, maybe this thing I like, like a lot, especially if it's very crowd-related, won't be back early next year or even late next year, but there are alternatives. It's kind of a yes and. It's like, yes, I'm going to grieve this loss, and I'm going to choose to move forward and find something, find a, a facsimile, to use a $6 word there, find a, a copy, a, a, an alternative that's acceptable. Okay, that would be what I would say on that. So... And we, we have to, I kind of came up with this term here of like micro closure, where you have to look at these little things, these micro forms of closure, where can I meet with this friend that I know has been, that's in my little quarantine pod or whatever, or that I know is kind of hanging around the same people, or is being safe, and can we do stuff and have a, a movie night? Can we have an outdoor movie night where we take a projector and put it on the side of my house, like project the movie on the side, or on the side of another building? Can we do something that is just acceptable enough? So if you're feeling like you can't even plan those kind of things and that you're lethargic, you're probably having some dissociation. You have to give yourself permission to say, I recognize my own trauma here. And maybe I'll think about one thing I can do that's a good alternative to just stewing in that. Yeah, I like that. Um, that's exactly right, Mally. So, I mean, it's very simple stuff what I'm saying, but are we doing it? Um, are we doing it enough? And are we giving ourselves permission? I mean, I, th I think teachers and therapists are very similar because, for one, there's a lot of expectations. And there's a lot of misconceptions, okay? So we can give people tools, but we can't make them use them. And the tools require practice. It's like a mental gym. Therapy is like a mental gym in many ways. And it's like, do you expect to go curl your arms and have huge biceps in one gym session? I hope you don't. I don't think you do. I don't think anyone does, right? In any hypothetical person. They know how that works. But for some reason, we don't have that same metaphorical framework when it comes to how we view mental health. It's like, you either have it or you don't. It's very dichotomous thinking. It's like, no, it's on a spectrum. We have to build it up the same way. We have to build it up through repeated exercise of our competencies. And if you don't have, you don't feel confident right now, right, look at what you feel incompetent at and try a little harder each day, right? Try a little harder to each passing moment and you'll feel better. So there's a big element of lifestyle loss here. Loss of rituals like weddings, gyms, meeting with friends. I'm kind of going off this list from that article I was talking about. And I thought about that. I thought, well, we need some new rituals, right? And they don't all have to be Zoom. They can be. Some of them can be that. Um, but some, they have to be based on what your personality and what you already enjoy, like what those elements are. So the big kind of takeaway of things I've been talking about so far, is like EMDR is very important. Yeah, yes, yes, that's a great point. Building mental health, like physical, yes. So EMDR is... Very good right now in COVID times because you can safely do it on screen. You, it will help you to kind of metabolize, to digest, to overcome these moment moments. You can think of what you were most upset about during initial COVID days, right? You could say, well, I got really upset when I heard about the announcement of stay-at-home orders, okay? That's a, that's a good initial target. Let's follow that. Go with that. The big EMDR phrase is go with that. It means like move your eyes and think of that. That's fine. Go back into the processing. 
um, after taking a little break to say, what are you noticing now? So um, to go back to what I was saying about, I want to pick up on that point. Your treatment plan, you know, you determine how ready you are for it. And if you are ready, you create that configuration of targets, okay? Past was the first one usually, because that's usually the root system that laid the groundwork for everything else. So let's say it's like you were abused as a child. So, okay, so what was the image, what image, rep so a, a, an EMDR target consists of an image, the thought about yourself that goes with the negative thought, the physical sensations you get from that thought, the emotions, and then you get what you would rather believe about yourself, and, and you rate how true your preferred thought is, like I'm strong now or that it's over, I'm safe, and you rate how the negative thought, like how relevant the thought of I'm in danger or I'm not, I'm not going to survive is right now, right? And so usually the negative thought's higher than the positive thought about yourself, okay? And then when you have all those elements of that negative memory and the preferred positive memory together, you have the, the, the client notices like what they're feeling like, okay, notice that memory, notice where you're going with that, notice what that evokes, okay, move your eyes back and forth. Now, take a break, what did you notice? Oh, I noticed I feel like I'm in the room there with my dad and he's, and he's hitting me or whatever. It's like, okay, breathe, go with that, follow that. And it sounds really weird because what the therapist is doing is basically checking in for brief bursts to pull you out of the trauma, to ask if you're, you're able to come into the room and talk to them and then you give a little update to the therapist and then you get sent back into the memory, right? It's like, wow, that's pretty hardcore. Yeah, because it's a desensitization therapy, right? So any desensitization therapy puts you into the situation, even virtually like EMDR where you're just imagining it, and helps to helps you to notice and then overcome. So you, your anxiety goes up and you overcome it and it goes down when your brain realizes that you're not going to die and you're in the present, right? So... Um, that we're going back to the example here. You notice it, and as the, you as you rate, how upsetting is this on a scale of one to ten, or excuse me, zero to ten? And then by the time it get like if you're at a, let's say you're at an eight, it's like okay, I feel like I'm really there. And then as you go through, you keep noticing that memory, and you're moving your eyes, and you keep checking in with the therapist, and your body and your mind recognize that you're safe. It goes to okay, you know what? I actually, I it's at, at a two or a three. I know what happened to me wasn't my fault. And I'm actually feeling safe right now. and But there's a little tinge of negativity left. So, okay, follow that. Yeah, notice and overcome. Okay, follow that thought. Keep going. Okay. And then by the time, like you, at a one or a zero, even at a two out of ten when it comes to the target, you can start to install uh, that preferred positive thought. So it's like, okay, I, I survived or I'm an overcomer. I'm resilient. I'm a badass, whatever. And you, you take that memory and you put it on the top of the traumatic memory, okay? It's called installation of a positive cognition with EMDR, a PC, positive cognition. And so what you're doing, you do that for a past memory, like the example I just gave of abuse, present memory, and a future. And so you're creating this ironclad foundation of competency, right? Where you're not only desensitizing the, you're taking the negative charge out of a past memory, but you're actually putting a positive spin to that memory there, right? And you're evoking that memory and replacing those negative elements with the fact that you survived and you're safe. And so there's a lot of fascinating research now in the EMDR field that's saying that what happens is there's a moderate mismatch between... So if, you, if your memory isn't different enough when you bring it up, it stays the same. If it's too different, your brain creates a new memory there instead. But what there, there's some evidence showing that EMDR helps to the eye movement is enough of a change while you're remembering that past thing that you're bringing, but not too much, where there's a moderate mismatch between what you're recalling and what actually was the original memory, where that memory is amended, where your brain indexes it in the hippocampus differently. It creates a different memory there that next time, because the hippocampus pulls up spatial locations of memories, and it pulls up in the frontal lobe where that memory is contained. It's very fascinating. We've got some really interesting research going on about EMDR. But... What, it's kind of a, a just good enough, a moderate Goldilocks effect of messing with the memory, right? That your brain actually changes it where when you bring it up in the future, it's like, oh yeah, that's that thing I and I'm a badass, I survived it. And so EMDR is nothing to sneeze at. The, the, eye, the combination of eye movement, focus on the past event, focus on your body, right? Those, three, those things together and the brain networks associated there 
all work together to your brain that you're safe and that this memory needs to be reintegrated in a different form. And, and what we would call long-term episodic storage of memory rather than an acute traumatic amygdala formed fight or flight memory that's a flash bulb in your face. Oh, you know, graphic of a fist coming at you or something, okay? So don't take my word for it. All the funny, the funny eye movement and the little self-directed question stuff, oh my gosh, it's so much more powerful than you may think. And I, I am a true believer in it. I've, I've been doing EMDR people since 2014, December 2014. It was one of, I mean, almost right after I graduated grad school, I started doing EMDR with people. So that was beneficial. I got trained in the methods early on. And so I was, I was very pliable and young in the field, uh, even more than I am now. I joke, I've been in here. I've been, I've been doing therapy for a while, people. But um, I, I got this training in the fact that memories that are encoded during times of extreme distress are like these thorns that once you pull out, people's self-esteem recalibrates. It's a beautiful way of looking at it, and it's called the Adaptive Information Processing Model, the AIP model that is intrinsic to EMDR. It's what Francine Shapiro hypothesized and studied when she, when she discovered EMDR. And so this idea that once you get rid of these cluster of memories, your brain stops avoiding situations that you were once avoiding and start, like let's say you avoid boundaries because you feel you don't deserve them. But when you get rid of a memory of someone really disrespecting your boundaries or laughing at you, it's like, or, or punishing you for having them even, God forbid then you start to be able to set those boundaries. And why is that? Well, because that aversive memory of what happened when you set them is gone. And you're able to say, that's, that's over. I'm a new me now. I deserve my boundaries. And so, I mean, if, if you don't get anything else from today, it's been a hodgepodge, but that's kind of how it is with me. I give a lot of good handouts to clients and I talk about a lot of good points. It's different when someone's interacting or asking me questions because I can kind of keep it more streamlined. Um, but the big thing to keep in mind is COVID is a, is a very ambiguous uh, trauma. And if you find yourself starting to get stressed at certain triggers, like things like masks, uh, washing your hands, whatever, work that out with an EMDR therapist. I just gave you an example of an EMDR session, right? Um, uh, going through abuse and re reprocessing it. It's like, so it would be very easy to substitute maybe someone coughing in the store and you being afraid of that. And then installing the positive thought, I'll survive this. I can, I can move. I can, I can gain autonomy. A big thing with trauma is a feeling of being constricted, right? A fear of being trapped, okay? Uh, claustrophobia is a serious thing. And there's an element of feeling trapped in any kind of trauma. Because you couldn't get away from it. It happened to you, right? If you could get away from it, you would have. So uh, what separates trauma from survival of something and not being bothered by it as much is just an element of being trapped. So right now we feel trapped by shutdowns, by an invisible virus. Do what you can to not feel trapped and reprogram memories where you do feel trapped, okay? I think that's a probably a pretty good place to end off. So if you got through all of this or you're watching the future, uh, awesome. And feel free to send any questions or, or messages to me. I am in the process of moving my license from one state to another. Well, I'm probably keeping it in the other state. But uh, I can help you find an EMDR person in your state. Like, really, really what I'll probably direct you to is I'll send you the emdria.org, emdria.org website. And you can enter in your zip code. And they even have, you can search by country. So this isn't just for the U.S. Um, determine if your work has an EAP, Employment Assistance Program, or something equivalent. Determine what your insurance is. A lot of therapists are willing to take insurance, by the way. Um, and if not, maybe there is a... Uh, yeah, I'll put info in the comments. Uh, maybe there's a way that you... Also, I'm, I'm this... People, if they DM me on Facebook, I will usually see that and be able to respond. Not always, if it's because it'll go to my requests if we're not friends on there, obviously. But uh, I'm on Twitter. I can I can put a link to that. Uh, that's a good place. I can put my email. That's a good place. I don't, yeah. I do have a podcast. It's called uh, The Fox. Another podcast by the name Fox. And I'll put a link to that. 
I interview people who talk about self-help or have a passion for some sort of self-help or mental health realm. It's a pretty eclectic bunch of people I've interviewed, actually. I'm going to go to a format probably where I do some interviews and some where I just go off the cuff about myths on trauma and things like what we just talked about, that trauma has to be fearing for your life. It can also be developmental trauma or relational trauma where you just have felt completely worthless your whole life, but you never thought you were going to die, right? Neglect. Ooh, neglect is, is often in many ways um, as if not as bad as if not worse active trauma. Not that either of them are great, but I was talking with a, a guest on my podcast, Dr. Carol Darsa, about that. She's phenomenal, but she was talking about how neglect is huge. So yeah, I'll put info in there, but just remember that uh, trauma can be a lot of different things. And the good news is when you nip it in the bud and you get help on it, or you even just do things to visually move your eyes around to distract yourself, not do the EMDR protocol on yourself for God's sake, but when you do things to get your mind out of that loop of your eyes being hung and you thinking of something negative, it, it can help a lot. So signing off for now, I'll be back, I think, on Thursday to do a recap. Maybe I'll teach an EMDR exercise. That would be a good move. Uh, but yeah, feel free to reach out and I will provide my info. Thanks so much.